Hello and welcome to an all new episode of Anime Brain Freeze. We are your made man hosts. I am John. And I'm CC. And when there's just too much cool anime to watch, we've got you covered. Today, John will take us to the seedy underbelly of the made cafe business, which apparently exists and is much more gruesome than anyone would expect in Akiba Made War. And after that, we will take a look at another bit of corporate warfare, the giant robot kind, in Mobile Suit Gundam, The Witch from Mercury. So get ready for blood, violence, space battles, hostile takeovers, and lots of moe moe kyun kyun, whatever that means. And definitely don't pause the pod, we'll be right back. Akihabara is the center of the universe for the coolest hobbies and quirkiest amusements. In the spring of 1999, bright-eyed Nagomi Wahira moves there with dreams of joining a maid cafe. She quickly dons an apron at Cafe Ton Tokoton, aka the pig hut, the pig house, the pig sty, however you want to refer to it. But adjusting to life in bustling Akihabara isn't as easy as serving tea and delighting customers. Paired with the dour Ranko, who never seems to smile, Nagami must do her best to elevate Cafe Ton Tokoton over all other maid cafes vying for top ranking. All the way, she'll slice out a place for herself amid the frills and thrills of life at a maid cafe. Just when Nagami's dreams are within her grasp, she discovers... Not everything is as it seems among the maid cafes of Akihabara. Akiba Maid War is a trip. We'll preface it by saying that, but this is the newest joint produced by PA Works. And, we have uh, talked about them many a times before. I have said many times sometimes that they kind of go really weird or go, you know, just really they have two moods yeah this is one of them i like this mood better than the other one the other one would be like iruzuku the slow contemplative uh mood uh, uh in pa work shows always tends to end up in meandering i don't know navel gazing but not really substantial shows where it's like yeah it's just girls being sad but that's kind of it not really why <laughs> You you don't really get or really they don't really delve into why and do something interesting with it at least from what I've seen. So I much more appreciate when uh, PA Works goes full ham like in this one or in Apare Ranman, for example, or or in uh yeah or your boy Kong Min. So when they go when they go they go and <laughs> they definitely went with this one. Went into the first episode of this really definitely expecting it to be like, ah, oh, you know, it's going to be uh, one of their uh, working girls uh, series. Like, we talked about Sakura Quest which, and Shiro Bako. Which is kind it kind of is. I mean, it is that. Yes. Let's not, let's not, like, it's it's not only the crazy. It's just like, no, the, this is also about maid cafes and the things that are usually done at maid cafes if anime are to be believed or normal anime are to be believed. Is, is there such a thing? Uh, but, uh, you know, what? What if you've never been to one, you might expect there to be. But, you know, then it's also the other thing. So Nagomi is this very unassuming young girl, and she just wants to uh, work in a maid cafe. That's okay. That's sure. Fine. And she gets hired at the uh, pigsty. Uh, pig hut, whatever you want to call it. The, there seems to be a general non-consensus about what to call it on the internet. Right. Uh, the translators called it Oinky Doink Cafe, which mm -hmm. I like that name a lot. Mm -hmm. I don't know about you. Yeah, I like both. I mean, Oinky Doink gets dropped. I'm, like every maid cafe, well, not every, but a lot of maid uh, cafes in Akiba are themed. Mm -hmm. Like. I, th I think all of them are themed, but not all of them are animal themed. But a lot of them, because they belong to this particular like group, creature land. I think they're called. Yes, creature land, Ketamono land. Yeah, and of course that also brings with it a particular way of speech patterns for each of the maid cafes that heavily relate to their theme. So 
yeah, animal themes. So all the uh, the mates in the Oinky Doink Cafe or in the uh, in the pigsty uh, use things that you would um, relate to a pig, like in terms of saying oink or something like that, or you know other things like a lot of a lot of animal puns are in this. Like the subs are doing the Lord's work in this show. <laughs> the the crew at High Dive go the extra mile when it comes to mm -hmm. uh, putting their own twist on the script. And it, and I would say nine times out of ten, it works pretty well. Yes, there yeah, there's some that don't land, but there are also a lot of uh, jokes in there that I I couldn't have thought of in a million years. Of like, how did you... How did you come up with actually connecting those words to that animal or animal noise? <laughs> like this is this is genius. This is brilliant. Thank you very much for this high dive. Mm. <laughs> so yeah, good, great job. Really, uh, that's that's mm. definitely one of the things that elevates the series uh, to uh, to uh, an even higher level than the the whole subject matter and ridiculous concept would uh, on its own. But just you know, having so much ridiculous dumb puns in there and i wonder if the dub does as good of a job when it comes to that yeah. because i haven't checked it out yeah i wonder i hadn't checked it either but i would like to just see if you know they kind of keep <laughs> that same energy mm -hmm. yeah so nagomi is this uh bright-eyed bushy-tailed we'll keep with the puns as long as we can <laughs> A uh, girl just going to start her first day of work at oinky doink cafe and she meets up uh with this, she seems to be uh, a lifer in the uh, maid, uh, the maid cafe line of work, Ranko Mannen. But she that's, has... that's closer. To... <laughs> she almost was a lifer. <laughs> so... Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, Ranko is very, very sort of stern, very stoic, kind of bordering on having this constant thousand yard stare and i wonder why that is hmm. um do you don't wonder for long though no we sort of find out in short order that ranko was you know a maid in her younger days as well we have to turn the clock back a little bit further i believe it was to like 1985 yeah she's like what is she what is she in current time she's now like at least 30 she's 35 35 right that was like everyone's of course commenting on that because 35 year old maid what the hell like that that is unheard of in this uh in this business whatever what are you still doing here so that that was i mean kind of demeaning but also funny and you know the way the way she owns it uh is is, uh, is really good yeah she uh she started uh working at uh the handmaid's tea house with uh her friend, her buddy, uh, and there's a hit put out on the leader of the cafe. <laughs> I mean, we're kind of burying the lead a bit, or we have been, even though it's in the title. But yes, this is... It is a made war. Yes, exactly. It is It is very much... The, the anime asks a uh, question, what if everyone in an anime was Roberta from Black Lagoon? Yes, that's... Perfect. At least to an extent. I mean, the real Roberta is Ranko because she's kind of the only one that is kind of Terminator level skilled in this, where like she can kill like a billion people and nothing happens to her, kind of, <laughs> at least for a while. So, yeah, that that kind of fits the bill. But everyone, every every mate in this has like has a gun ready and is ready to shoot and mow down other mates, and uh, it's ridiculous. It's very. It feels very Yakuza game series ish in terms of tone and how ridiculous it's just with even more death involved, I guess. I mean, in the first episode alone. So the manager, the unnamed manager <laughs> for the entire series of uh, the Oinky Doink Cafe owes the Creature Land group <clears throat> sweets money. Mm -hmm. What is what is sweets money? Shut up! Don't worry about it. <laughs> it's protection money, of course it is. <laughs> it's how and, this works. 
and, and Creature Land is, 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 a, is a Yakuza group. It's like a head Yakuza family, whatever, that has a subfamilies under them. It's the whole... It's, mm. that, that's just what it is. That's what this, what this show is. It's a Yakuza war, just with mates. <laughs> so when a debt collector comes knocking on the cafe door, uh, who, and he's dressed just like, you know, your stereotypical otaku. You thought he looked... He might have looked like an actual character or been inspired yeah i thought he was a parody right? parody of someone from uh you know uh, from actual historical japan in terms of um you know who also was in uh, uh sengoku basara who was one of mm. the main guys there i forgot his name not date masamono the other guy the one with the spears and the red headband uh, whatever yukimura yes so um yeah i can kind of see that yeah but no that's just i mean that was maybe the inspiration to the guy but apparently there's like a stereotypical Japanese otaku archetype when it comes to outfit and everything and having just two giant posters probably with naked girls on them in his backpack <laughs> sticking out looking like sword hills or shit so uh, that's what that guy looks like but yeah he's a debt collector for some reason <laughs> yes um, and when he comes knocking in order to uh, the, the manager doesn't have the money because no. she's She's bad with the money and spends she's it bad all with everything. And she gambles it away. Yes, she's bad. Let we get to her maybe a bit later, just her character when we go into some of the other characters. But uh, she was probably my favorite character in this show. Just saying, she's <laughs> because she's horrible. Great. She's yeah. a horrible person. <laughs> in her horribleness is greatness. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Yes, so when uh, the debt collector comes knocking, uh, the, he basically at, says, in exchange, in exchange for not paying what you owe, you got to do us a favor. And they have to make a, I believe it was a, making a delivery to a rival maid cafe, <clears throat> Wov Wov Moonbeam. That's that's the name. Welcome mm-hmm. to Akiba, everyone. And when they get there and deliver the letter, it, I believe, turns out, as I recall, turns out to be a, yeah, a letter of, you know, proclamation that, uh, oh, all you maids are dead. We're here to kill you dead. Uh, Best watch your backs. And they pull out their guns and a big old gunfight ensues right in the cafe. In one of my favorite gags in this whole series is in this moment. Prior to that, Ronko and Nagomi go downstairs from Oinky Doink to get ramen. And they get there and the bloodshed breaks out. And the, <laughs> the first girl that Ronko shoots just starts bleeding so profusely. It's it's absurd. Yes. It's like, it's comical. It's like Mortal Kombat levels of blood spatter. It's like three giant blood, spur, uh, blood spurts, but you know, with perfect comically timed long pauses in between, where it's like you thought that was it, and then comes another one, and you thought that was it, and then comes another. <laughs> and it gets all over Nagomi, and she's like, "Oh wait, I'm still wearing this smock from when we were at the Rama place." And I'm like, "That's so good! That's so good!" Yes, I, like they go the several minutes without addressing that she's wearing this, and then suddenly it's like. Perfect. Thank you for bringing it back around. Yes. I mean, she's in shock. That's why she she, she notices at this point, and it's and rightfully so. Like, she, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, it's funny as fuck. Also, you know, there are small hints even bef- uh, like before that that things are going to get super crazy. I mean, the biggest thing, and I wish they wouldn't have done that, is that they kind of give away that what the show is in the very first seconds of the show. They do a teaser where you see um, Ranko's mentor or whatever, uh, old mentor, being shot. Mm-hmm. And I wish that wouldn't have been in there. I wish they would have started the show like a damn old maid show, like what you expected it would be, right? right. Like just, you know, uh, Nagumi just going out there, doing the job, and then some weird things start happening with the sweets money. And you're like, what is going on here? And then, you know, the owner just talking about miracles and believing that Ranko N- uh, Nagumi can carry out the assignment, which, if you don't know, sounds super benign. But, you know, in the background, already setting up new job recruitment poster. <laughs> yep. And you're like, what? Hmm. <laughs> and then, you know... It gets weirder and weirder. There's this one bunny girl in Wolf of Moonbeam that is getting her ponytail cut off and making like this big noise about it. Like, 
her finger is getting cut off because that's what would happen, you know, in the Yakuza, uh, Yakuza world, I guess. So it's equivalent to that. And that it would be more of a, like, slow build towards insanity while the way they did it here in the first episode, you immediately know what the shit is going on. Like, mates, and then immediately, you know, one gets off with a, uh, with a, with a, with a gunshot and stuff like that. If that wasn't in there, I felt like the surprise, even though if you look at the title and, or if you've seen a trailer or whatever, but if you go in completely unknowingly, this would have been a nicer thing. And then, you know, the whole bloody shit erupts, you know, the, the joke with the blood spurts that you mentioned. And, of mm. course, timing the big bloody action scene in the first episode to a bouncy Mate Morris song performed <laughs> by one of the other mates from Oinky Doink, Yumichi, in the cafe is genius. They even super time the gunshots, punches, and kicks to the beat of the music. It's super good. It's fantastic. <laughs> it's really really great i think only maybe topped by the last musical number in this uh in this show which mm. has a more emotional component to it i would say this is in the first episode this is just wild insanity and fun times and then the last one even has you know it's more tense i would say you know yeah. and also the, you are now more involved with the characters and everything and it's just it's do or die, whatever. So, yeah, I love them both equally, just for different reasons. Great stuff. Like, fantastic. And at this point, if you're not on board at this point with what this show is doing, just, I guess, get out. Because yeah. it's just only going to get crazier from here on out if that's not your thing. Like, the if, if that ridiculousness is not what you're here for, just leave. I couldn't leave at this point anymore. It's like, okay, all right, you, you just stop pandering to my very existence. Thank you very much. Like, if this, if this was just, you know, just normal a normal work comedy with mates, I would have been like, yeah, this is... But you do this shit with how they time the music and then to to the... To the wild violence and killing spree that Ranko is going on and all these cute bunny girls just getting slaughtered left and right. You're like, okay... Okay, I'm here for this. I'm I'm fine. I assume this was the same for you, Jen. I mean, you pro were probably already on board before this, but holy shit, this uh, yeah. I mean, if it was you know like a stock whatever working you know whatever show, I probably would have been like, eh, you know, maybe this will be alright. But after that first episode, it's like, how could you not mm -hmm. want to keep going and seeing where the insanity ends? Yes, exactly. And I feel like. PA works when they go all in on a particular style thing, right? When they're like, okay, this is the theme of the show, and we're just going to go full force ahead, as dumb and ridiculous as it might be. But we make everything fit to this theme. We make the story fit. We make whatever, all the characters, how they behave, everything, the world, the environment, everything, the look of the whole show, we make it fit so that it works perfectly together. They're really good at that. They did it very good, very well in Apara, uh, Aparare Runman, like doing the old horse crazy races thing, right? Mm. And then th uh, theming that Wild Western-ish and it all works together really well. All these colorful characters. Apparently they did it in Ya Boy Kongming with the whole, you know, club mm -hmm. musical thing, but also war tactics, right? And they're yes. doing it here too because the OP also very feels very Black Lagoon-ish. Yeah, when it starts I couldn't like put my super, finger on it, but you're right. Yeah, it starts very... It's like the characters walking into the camera in slow-mo they look menacing and everything like it's like this really it's really this this grimy imagery and then they contrast that with the standard standard made customer service language that the characters are doing in the lyrics and then also you know a bouncy moe song at the end that this you know dark beat turns into but it's really, it works. It just fucking works. It's like, <laughs> oh, this is what the show is. It's crazy bullshit. I love it. <laughs> and then the like 60s, 70s gangster movie yes. ending theme. Yes, yes, it's yes, so yes. so good. Yes, everything. Like everything is styled like the uh, staff role to a classic gangster movie. Like the, the music, even the credits that are written ver vertically, which you mm. don't really see in anime that much. 
you know, it's just that the lyrics don't necessarily match the tone, which makes it even better. Like, if you read the first couple of lyrics, hold on, let me get the, let me get this so I can just read it here. Wait, another chance to go moe moe kyun. I come to the pigsty for my moe moe kyun. <laughs> That's my way of life. The one who makes fun of me sees blood. Uh, but yeah, you can see, you can see the theme. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, it's, uh, it's ridiculous, and I love it, and I think it's great. And I think they that they fit everything so neatly into. Let's be honest, a ludicrous concept. Like, this shouldn't work on paper. But since it's anime, and it's pulled off really well by people who really knew what they were doing and where they wanted to go with this show, mm. it just all works. It just all fits together. It's just like, once you understand what the show is doing, it just, it works. It's, it, you have to accept it, and the show will accept you, and it, you're going to have a fun time. So, yeah, that's, that's how it is. <laughs> I loved it. Oh, me too, dude. I didn't really say it, but the show was directed by Soichi Masui, who's uh, worked on some other stuff for PA works, like uh, Sakura Quest in particular, but also did some stuff like uh, Scrapped Princess, Chika the Coffin Princess, uh, Brotherhood Final Fantasy XV, which uh, I don't know about you. I kind of liked that. Yeah, sure. I, I like that too. It's nice to, you know, nice to see characters outside of their element. Nice to see an entire story outside of its element as mm -hmm. well. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, but yeah, we talked a little bit about uh, Nagomi and Ronko a bit. Uh, the but we'll say that at the end of the first episode, uh, Nagomi is like, what am I doing here? I need to get out. I need oh, yeah. to go. Oh, yeah. And She's very scared. Ron Rightfully so. <laughs> Ronko locks the door to their bedroom that she's moved into and says, you're here now, basically. <laughs> well, yeah, she's not that. She's not threatening her or anything. She's just like, yeah, this is, you know, <laughs> we, you, you made your, you you made made your choice, kind of. But also maybe Nagumi interprets the thing wrong and she could be would be able to leave. But also maybe Ranko knows maybe if she leaves now after they uh, did that shit, she's maybe, you know, fair game to the other maid cafes and Ranko couldn't protect her. It mm. could be a bunch of things, right? But Nagumi, obviously, she's the straight woman. Like, she's the our view into this crazy world because she's new there and she d just wanted to be a maid. And, uh, you know, <laughs> she's not even that good at being a maid in the beginning, but, you know, she gets slowly getting there and everything, and she has passion for it. But, yeah, then all this crazy swerve uh, is thrown her way, and she's like, this cur curveball is thrown her, her way, and mm -hmm. she has to deal with it. And she kind of does it pretty well. I mean, of course, there's some time she needs to get used to it, but slowly and surely... She finds out that the maid cafe is very important to her and the people that are living there. And that um, emboldens her and yeah. gives her a lot of power. And she's growing and growing over the course of the series. Uh, and that's really fun to see. I thought her mm -hmm. development was, uh, was a really good, uh, was, was really well pulled off. Yeah, seeing, like, her, seeing her grow into the job as well as the role was pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I thought her... She has one of the most uh, satisfying and most understandable, I guess, and also most tight character arcs in an anime. Like, mm. like it feels like thought through from beginning to end. She definitely has a complete arc. Yeah, and I appreciated that. I, I liked where she started. I liked how her her way, her journey, and I liked I liked quote unquote where she ended up, uh, and. You know, in her own way and everything. It, that yeah. Was too. And uh, it it was a good, it's a good character story. Yeah, the end. Not quite the end. Well, you know, mm -hmm. uh, where the the end of her story within the purview of this show, I, I sort of alluded to last time mm -hmm. that I really liked the way a show we were going to talk about this season ended and this was it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is definitely it. Yeah, I, I thought it was great too. Like, uh, it felt like uh, a nice exclamation uh, mark on on her story at the end there, and how it fit, and you know everything, how the series built it up and stuff like that. So yeah, it uh, it it was good. It was really good. I wouldn't, 
you know, personal preference. I wouldn't rank it above Mob Psycho 100. Just, yeah, but uh, but that's me. Uh, that's me. I love I love Mob Psycho 100 to death, and uh, I I was I felt like uh, I was treated to one of the most perfect endings uh, ever. And for that show, it just gave the extra kick. But just for a one time thing, which this seems to be, I don't think this will get another season this feels like one of pa works one time things as that it was incredibly well realized and especially if you consider the ridiculous concept that screams that it would only get just you know nonsense characters without any real arcs and it's just you know we're just here for the hijinks but instead we get some really good character arcs in this with nagumi maybe being the best one uh, if maybe, but also maybe Ranko, I'm not sure. Uh, we got a, we got, we got a couple like all the main mates, except for maybe Yumechi because she kind of stays the same person. I feel like for most of the show. Yeah, there's a couple other main mates in the Oinky Doink Cafe and the first is Yume Hiragi, uh, otherwise known as Yumechi, mm-hmm. and she's like uh, one of the ace mates at Oinky Doink because you know she's very personable and charismatic with the customers and whatnot but she it's it it's very much an act yeah of course they, they uh, always I mean, call... if in this line of work yeah you kind of got to put that face on yeah so they always call her like she basically they always say she basically gave up human her humanity mm-hmm. uh, she's so, she's she's such a good maid that she's not real anymore most of the time which is kind of I don't know, maybe the meeting, but, you know, she is really good at it. But you notice that once she's done with the customers, she becomes a completely different person. She becomes very cynical and, you know, feels a bit hardened. And it's like, get the fuck out of here. You're ruining my quota or whatever. I'm keeping this thing alive and stuff like that. So she's very uh, dominating in in that workspace uh, because she is the best mate there. It's just how it is. Uh, But, you know, it feels like... She's living a double life. <laughs> but she also doesn't take any uh, guff from anyone about the cafe or about any of the other people who work no, no, there. No, no, so. no. None of them do. Like, everyone, well, except for the chief, maybe. Uh, <laughs> uh, everyone, like, is really passionate about their workplace. They're like, this is where we are, and we like it here. And even if it's not, like, the most prestigious or quite the opposite, really – Thing we like what we have here. We like the work we do, and we like our customers. And anyone who says anything against that, or even tries to hurt some of my colleagues, or or wor- tries to do harm to our workplace, is gonna get a gun barrel jammed down their throat. So mm-hmm. that's how it works. And yeah, everybody in in this cafe kind of, except for the chief, like I said, kind of buddies that <laughs> that attitude. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, and so even if Ranko, uh, as, as I mentioned before, in terms of how she uh, behaves and everything, doesn't quite fit into, like at first glance, into that environment because she's like she's thirty five. She is, uh, she is very stern. Uh, she is, you know, the a Terminator style. Whatever. She is not even that good at being, you know, the the cutesy mate stuff. She's not good at uh, at that at all. But also, she needs to learn pretty much as much as uh, Nagumi when it comes to preparing food and everything. But she is also very passionate, like in her own way. She is very like, I want to be a maid, and to me, this means that and that and that, and I don't want to be anything else. This is my life. Mm. And that kind of she's able to convey that to her colleagues after a while. Like they they accept her even if she you know is different, and the customers do too. Like she gets her own set of customers that are very attached to her. That is neat. <laughs> I mean that also kind of back. I wouldn't say backfires, but we have an episode that kind of becomes very sad because of that. And the show can do that well too. Like the show cannot only do zany comedy very well. There's like, I don't even know which episode that was, but there's one, uh, yeah. Episode 10, episode 10, uh, is the, sh- uh, is the episode that proves that the show is also really good at doing like serious and tragic stuff. Of course, it's a bit theatrical and everything, but it doesn't feel ham-fisted or stuff like that. And Ranko mm. is kind of at the center point of that. 
I mean, her whole story is kind of sad because right from the get-go, you realize, okay, she's in this for also maybe for revenge or she at least has a hot-boiled origin story with her, you know, chief being killed. Uh, and then we learn she got into prison because she could, took revenge for that and stuff like that. That, of course, is always part uh, is part of the entire show, but it is not her uh, her whole character. There's only parts of it. And I feel like the show is really good at... Uh, showing us uh, all the different facets of uh, of what Ranko really is all about, and I didn't expect that, but I appreciate it. <laughs> mm-hmm. So yeah, I I thought her character was great, and I think she's a she's just a great complementary piece to all the other mates in there who are more you know the standard mate ish characters, you know more bouncy. Uh, heartfelt, good, good mood. Even if it's just an act, a front, just with Yumichi, whatever. But that's what kind of they are, and she's kind of like going against that. But you know, not, not to be cynical or everything or anything. She's that's just the way she is. And I thought that was really entertaining. I don't know how you felt uh, about her character in general. I mean, yeah, that pretty much uh, sums it up, to be honest. All right. Uh, who else do we have? There's Shino Goto, otherwise known as Sheepbone. She kind of has more of a a devil may care attitude. Yes, yes, most mostly. <laughs> but also, just like I mentioned before, once her understanding of what she likes about her workplace being threatened, she's willing to go the extra mile to bring it back to to the stuff she likes or bring it back to the roots, whatever. Uh, there, there's a very uh, important episode. I don't want to give it away where, you know, they get the, the, the mates that get uh, visited by a drill instructor to, <laughs> to, you know, make them upstanding, perfect mates and everything. And kind of everyone falls for it except for her. And you usually would expect her to maybe fall in line, but she kind of becomes the odd man out. And that kind of results also into bullying because they, the other Kind of get others, kind of get brainwashed a bit with you know the drill instructor's methods and everything, but she kind of goes against it. And I didn't expect her to do that, and I loved it. And I loved the conclusion to that episode. I thought it was great. That was probably one of my favorite ones in in this uh, in this show because it was, it was really so, strong. Yeah, it was so it was so funny. Like the whole show takes kind of a at several points, not only at this point, but at other points too. The show takes a huge dump on the. You exist for, you know, your head company, your group, your wor- only, you know, your workplace, whatever, uh, indoctrination bullshit. We get stuff like the maids. I think that's what the drill instructor says even at some point. The maids give the group sweets money so the group protects the maids, which is a lot of bullshit because they're <laughs> at war constantly and everyone di- is dying. So that's crap. It's fine. Like, don't worry about it. You know, I've, I've, I think I've mentioned this before. I've, I've, I've always had problems with shows that paint like the... Yakuza quote unquote profession as something noble or like they are living by a knightly code or some shit like that. Like fuck off with that nonsense. They're just thugs and criminals that want to make money off the back of other people. Nothing noble about it, even if they want to paint it that way. And the show knows that kinda and is having fun with all the stuff by uh, satirizing the crap out of it. And I love that. And I feel like they still sneak some in there with like, hey, yeah, but we like our lifestyle. And you could also attribute it that maybe some to some Yakuza groups. I don't know. But they kind of skirt around that by this also being about a maid cafe where the girls want to sing and dance and service their customers and have a good time, mm-hmm. which is a bit of a different thing to what, you know, your standard Yakuza probably do. Uh, so there you go. But I loved it. I loved the whole, every, every time the show was like, yeah, fuck this adhering to, you know, this this family whatever structure, this made up bullshit where it's like, oh, we protect our lower no, fuck off. Uh and uh <laughs> Yeah, it it was fun. It was really fun. Uh I, I, I liked that a lot and I liked the episode where shit Shippon kinda had the spotlight in that regard. Because like you said, most of the time she seems like shrug very, very lackadaisical. Yeah, very lackadaisical. She's she's here, she's hanging out. She's having a good time, but she's not super invested. But, you know, once uh, once that happens, of course, she needs a bit of help because uh, it, it seems like uh, risky to st- even stay there at some point. She just want to leave, wants to leave. But, you know, someone else is like, hey, come, 
come on, I'm on your side, whatever. So it's cool. I thought I thought she was uh, she was really fun, at least in that episode and in others too with her. You know, sometimes snide comments, whatever. But everyone does that in the show, kind of except for Nagomi, I guess, because she's very straightforward, and Ranko doesn't deal with that either because she's like this. The, the maid of, of a few words. <laughs> mm. <laughs> Which works for some customers, but yeah, it's fun. But yeah, we should mention the best character in this show, John. Do you mean the manager? The, yes, the manager, the chief, whatever you want to call her. Who is... Apparently she does have a name? Yeah, she does, but nobody calls her by that in the show, I think. Maybe at one point... But yeah, I, I don't I don't ever remember them calling the manager by her proper name, but she, no. it is Yasko Yayegachi. Yeah, yeah. But they always call her manager or chief or whatever, whatever the subs decide uh, to call her. But yeah. All right. Uh, well, she's a mood. <laughs> that 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 woman is. Uh, she's very. She's very success oriented in terms of making money, but like you already mentioned, she's really bad at that. <laughs> like that's, uh, that's a way to word it. Yes, she is like she is. Hey, let's do some ridiculous gambling stuff to to uh, get out of our uh, sweet money debt, and then they actually make some money, and there would be a great place to stop. But of course, she can't because she's uh, she's who she is, and then shit gets worse. Mm -hmm. And she pulls stuff like that in almost every episode. Like, I would say 50% of the time, she is the reason that shit goes really badly <laughs> for her for her maid cafe that she is managing. Let's not forget that. Mostly because she can't shut her mouth. Yeah, she, she, yeah, she constantly... Like, I don't know if there's ever a, uh, an episode where she gets the foot out of her mouth. No. It's just in there constantly. <laughs> But also, she kind of owns it at some uh, in some way. Like it's she's kind of she's kind of enthusiastic, partially about being this little shit. <laughs> like there's this one episode where for some reason she gets naked to apologize, and the person she's apologizing to, you think that she the person commanded her to do that, but, but at the end of the scene, she's like, "Why are you naked?" <laughs> <laughs> and then you realize, oh, okay. <laughs> It wasn't punishment. She was just, you know, trying to uh, to create the optimal scenario where she would her where her apology would be accepted. And there's seen boatload of scenes in this show with that character. Like she has the best comedy uh, scenes. Why does she suddenly have an eye patch at some point? Shut like, up! Don't worry about it. Like I mentioned, why does she suddenly get naked? Like her dream is to, she meant verbalize that at some point, is to own a house on Hawaii with a bunch of pretty boys surrounding her and not having to work anymore. Don't get me wrong, I totally get it. Not the pretty boys part, but you know, the, the other stuff, you know. Well, maybe Hawaii would be nice, but I would be fine here and not having to work anymore. So I get it, I get her, but it's fun seeing her just, just come out and say that and... There is there's also an episode where Ranko has to fight in a martial arts box thing and she of course they bet against her because yeah. that's how they want to make the money and she gives like this motivational Rocky movie speech to Ranko to convince her that she must lose the match which is amazing it's like <laughs> it's so good <laughs> But then she and her opponent find motivation to fight against each other, and whoops, there goes all the money. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, because it always everything the chief, the manager plans, backfires on her because she's really bad at that. She, it gets so bad that she at some point just gets thrown out of the, out of her own cafe at some point by the drill instructor, and she has to rummage through the garbage with the panda. By the way, there's a panda in this cafe. Yeah, um... in a pick themed cafe which makes no sense yeah i was gonna say who would you think would be the mascot for a pig themed cafe you're wrong it's a panda but believe us or not dear listener the panda actually makes sense they make the panda make sense at some point which is ridiculous but that kind of adheres to the th other theme of the show again so it works and it's great and i was surprised the panda also has an arc and that yeah. arc is good. And that was, that was wild. It's 
I was, I was, John, I was taken aback by how much good character work there is in this, in this stupid show. <laughs> it's, it's, this show definitely over delivers. Yeah, in more ways than one. There's so many great side gags. There's so much hijinks. There's so much cool action in there. I mean, it's not the best looking PA show we've seen so far. I would say it's good. Mm. It's in a, on a very high quality level, but I feel like I've seen other shows of them that look better, that ne don't necessarily were better. Uh, Seriously, yeah, it comes to mind, which I think was also a PA works show uh, yeah. directed by Marcia Rondo. But I that was about that one. Yeah, but that story wise, that kind of fell apart after a while. Looked amazing from beginning to end. But, you know, in this, you have some really good looking fights. But some of the episodes also are kind of pretty standard. There's very limited animation. There's not that much action happening or whatever. Mm. Um, and, you know, then it looks kind of okay. But the story and the characters are so much fun that you just, you don't care about the more, you know, low-key animation moments. It's just every episode is a blast. Every episode is a blast in this. Oh, yeah, for sure. I wasn't really, like, the, the moments, the big moments definitely stand out. But the, uh, you know, the ones where it's not as, you know, crazy produced, they don't really uh, uh, stick out or anything. They're just sort of there, you know, it's, it's, it is what it is. Yeah. Like I said, a lot of good jokes in there. I love that the anime figurine company heads are portrayed as criminals in the show as well, because let's be honest, in real life, they probably are. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, they might just as well have put idle uh, managers in there or something like that. <laughs> It would have worked too. Uh, yeah, I don't even want to know how much uh, how much dark shit is going on in those professions and that in that line of work and companies, whatever. So, um, hmm. but yeah, that that worked really well. And uh, yeah, the whole contrast between the cutesy language in some parts, and then you have this wild Yankee or or Yakuza uh, rough language uh, Japanese slang language in there when they when the mates switch the mode right and they, yeah. they become like attack animals. <laughs> Just, uh, suddenly you turn on the Oikora. Yeah, and I I don't feel like I need to say it, but as fun as the comedy is, it can get really dark at some point. The baseball match comes to mind, so uh, yeah, be prepared who, who, for that. But all of it works. <laughs> who are these people? Oh, they're just three. Oh God, where are they from? Three Venezuelan guys that the manager <laughs> hired off the street. What? That was one. Of the, those were the lighter jokes in that episode, John. I'm talking I know, about. The, but, yeah. but that one in particular stood out because, like, where did these three guys come from? And then they just sort of dropped that that little nugget of uh, knowledge, and I'm like, oh, okay, all right. So that's yeah, where, that's where Jose, Luis, and Antonio came from. Got it. Yeah, it's fine. The comedy also. The, the, thanks for reminding me. The comedy in this is also a really neat mixture. Like you have this. It's funny because it's over the top bullshit stuff. That's a lot of that. What is in there? You had a, have a lot of puns. You had a, have a lot of dialogue humor. You had a, have a lot of situational comedy. But you also had a lot. Have a lot of just random things that you. I don't know. The way it's animated and pulled off, you don't see that as much in other anime. The Venezuelans come to mind. Uh, but also lots of weird elevator jokes in this that are really well done and varied and that feel like, okay, I don't know why they're in this show, but they work for some reason. And, mm -hmm. and yeah, it's great. And uh, I, I I don't know. I don't have really that much negative to say about uh, the show. I feel maybe some of the characters that get introduced, I felt like they would have a bigger role, like Manami comes to mind, for example. But st they still serve a purpose, and mm. it's not like they're in there just for fluff or anything. So, yeah, I it's it's cool. Like even the ridiculous stuff sometimes has a really good emotional compo uh, component to it and everything. And I feel like if you if you after the first episode feel like you you could like this is the ride you would be willing to get on, you will have an immensely good time because it gets only wilder and more fun from there on out like i didn't feel like the show dialed back at any po at any moment like went back downhill like i feel like it was not that it was like constantly building up the crazy but every time you had like finished up one thing 
another different flavor came around came around the corner. It also doesn't just stick to the same thing all the time. The main theme, sure, but also hey, now we we got a crazy action scene, and in this next episode, we focus more on characters uh, on developing our main characters and their backstories and stuff like that, and then we do some wild casino bullshit. And then, you know, we do ba a baseball episode. And then, you know, whatever. Karaoke. I don't... And then an actual mafia gang war for two episodes. In episode seven and eight. That is appropriately titled Creatureland Gang War Chronicles or something. Yeah. With, with, a, with a narrator for flashbacks. <laughs> so, yeah, that that's great. Like, there's a bunch of different shit in this show, and all of it kind of works uh, and fits together. And yeah, I didn't expect that when you mentioned the show. It's like, oh, this is this is probably fun, but it's probably just dumb bullshit. And there's a lot of that in there. Don't get me wrong, but I feel like there was m a lot more uh, to chew on in there than I would have expected. I, I see. It seems to me that you had the same experience. Yeah, for sure. Like, like I said at the top, I. I was expecting just something dumb and fluffy going in. We got we got literal made Yakuza action show that over delivered at every turn. It had it had just a bunch of great characters and super fun moments and just like I I've said this before and I feel like it bears saying every time that PA works just, they just go for it every time. So yeah. I'm super glad to see that they had a hand in something fun again. Yeah, uh, John, where can people watch it? Uh, you can watch it on High Dive, which is Sentai Filmworks um, streaming platform. Uh, but it's on a few other services depending on where you live. It looks like it may be on Crunchyroll in certain territories. And... Uh, on a few other places as well. So it's not impossible to find to watch. And I, I, I believe that we, both of us would encourage uh, y'all to check it out. All right, John Gundam. Mm -hmm. Gundam. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> Yeah. I mean, we've talked about this giant-ass franchise uh, many times over now. In review for... Wait, which Gundam shows have we reviewed? We reviewed... Build Divers, Iron Blood, Origin. Yeah, I guess we mostly just talked about Unicorn and Passing when they did the recut TV version. I don't know, I didn't like Unicorn. I'm not whole, big into the whole... Uh... Universal Century stuff? <laughs> Some of the UC stuff is fine. I mean, Origin get, is UC stuff. When we get into, like, the weirdo, weirdo new type stuff that uh, <laughs> yeah. that Unicorn was and the encounter between Benajer and Full Frontal, and it was like this was – I walked away from the end of Unicorn saying this was stupid, and I didn't <laughs> even bother to watch Hathaway's Flash. I heard how the West Flames are rather good, but I've not seen it yet. And that new thing that is set during the uh, original run of the sh uh, of of the original Mobile Suit Gundam, yeah. but the episode that they kind of cut out or whatever happened there that was so badly animated and they Kuru's Dones Island. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That uh, just recently uh, got released as a movie and apparently as a standalone story, it's pretty damn good. I will check that out. But uh, yeah. Yeah, I don't know about... much about that aside from it exists. I like Unicorn, but I also didn't see the TV version. I saw the movie version. And that, uh, just judging from what from people who have watched both versions, uh, it's uh, like night and day, apparently. That doesn't maybe change the fact, because I agree the finale to that either way was really crazy. But then again, so was the finale to um, a charged counterattack. Because that also went into the really crazy mind space across all time and space. New uh, time can communicate, uh, whatever. So right? then I probably would hate that too. Yeah, maybe. But I feel like it probably wasn't as weirdly cut up in the movie version. So like, that everything made a bit more sense. At least like, that one. There's still large holes in my UC knowledge. Like I haven't mm. watched Shard's Counterattack. I haven't watched Zeta or Double Zeta. 
Uh, there's there's other UC movies as well that I think I'm forgetting. Well, there's the movie recuts of Zeta and Double Zeta, but then there's other stuff I think. Yeah, We're I don't getting know into if I'll, the weeds. Yeah, I, I I don't know if I'll ever get back. I mean, I watched the three uh, compilation movies for the original Gundam show, mm. which were okay. Like, I'm not the biggest fan of the original Gundam, just in terms of I. That's but but that's me with very old, very old quote-unquote, like 10 years older than me, I guess, anime. <laughs> Not yeah. even 10 years. When when did the original? 79, right? 1979, yep, that's yeah, why. So two UC years older than me. Two years older than me. So yeah. <laughs> I can't deal with things that are almost as old with as me. I there tr- you go. I tried watching 0079 when it had its run on Toonami mm-hmm. ages and ages ago. And it seemed... Fine. I, I didn't have any issue with the dub or anything. That wasn't my problem. It was the storytelling and how stupid yeah. and scattershot it was. So I sat down and watched the movies instead. And I feel like I had a generally better time. But I guess it also missed out on certain details, which is like, okay, fine. You got to make cuts somewhere. Tomino also has a really weird, not great method of telling his stories yeah, yeah like, I, have, me I have complained about g reco before and how it feels like every conversation the characters are not talking to each other mm. and i hate that it feels like no one can ever have a conversation they're just they're talking past each other talking through each other they're not talking to each other and that happened several times and i remember feeling like this feels really strange and then i got to the end of the show and i was like no the show is bad that's that seems to also be except for the weird hardcore weirdo Gundam weirdos who maybe get a kick out of every Tomino show, but I think no one really likes G Reco. Uh, even I mean, uh, I think I think a friend of ours liked G Reco. I don't know why he does, but he mm-hmm. does. But he maybe also because the, the the Gundams are look good. Yeah, I mean the G self is cool, I guess. Yeah, but um, he also made the point that. In G Reco, it was kind of like, oh, this is basically Baby's first war. That's why it's so weird. Mm. And alternate universe scene is like, that doesn't excuse it, my guy, from being really weird and badly written. I mean, I liked uh, what I've seen of Thunderbolt, for example. And that's oh not God. his. Thunderbolt but, was cool. But that's also Universal Century, right? So, yeah. I think... no, th- Thunderbolt was cool. Um, right narrative, I hadn't watched either. So. I don't know if that's good. <laughs> yeah, I. When I, I, saw, I heard bad things about it. I I, th- I heard I thought that um, when I saw I, oh it takes place after Unicorn, I was just like, mm. Mm, I heard uh, Hathaway's flesh is better. Like I, I think there's really good stuff in UC, like Eighth mm. Team, like Double O Eighty Three. I I love those. I love those a lot. Mm. But kind of like the core stuff is like mm, like I mean there's do, bad do, stuff in the do you really care? stuff too. Do you really care about Igloo or F91 or Victory Gundam or G Savior? Do you <laughs> care about G Savior? Probably not. There but I go. also don't care about Gundam Seed Destiny. Oh, uh, God, that's, the less said about Seed, the better. I don't. I don't care much about Double O Season, two, but Season Two is this I, general Gundam problem. We'll get to that once we yeah. get to the second season of this show. Maybe I hope not. I, I hope, hope we don't good. have to bring that up. Yeah, because that's that's one of the things. It's like the Gundam sickness. I feel like this. It's, a lot of Gundam shows start really strong with a good concept, with a good cast of characters, and then kind of loses its way or, uh, after a while. Iron Blooded Orphans was like that. It was still decent, but it was def- It didn't end as strong as it be- started. Mm. Gundam Seed. I liked the first. I liked the first season of Gundam Seed. It was very standard shit, but it was the first Gundam show I watched actually. So. I there might be nostalgia involved. Seed but, was weird because it tried to be a reboot, but yeah, it kind but, of turned out not being that. Yeah, I guess not. But it kind of works. The character motivation still worked for me in that first in, in Seed. Seed Destiny was a nightmare. Like it was one of the worst anime I've ever seen. Uh-huh. Like ever, it was horrible. You know, and Double O first season was good. Second season was eh, and you know, it, that seems to be, I don't know, H. Pr- probably also the same thing, maybe. You know, so. I, I I didn't hate age, but mm. I, I understand where a lot of people have gripes with it. I mean, I, I will say this. 
G Reco was the series that aired immediately after age. So I think age, uh, was a lot better in comparison. <laughs> yeah. I'm not surprised, mm. but yeah. Yeah. But also, you know, with the spin-off stuff, like I think you really like Gundam build fighters and then Gundam build divers didn't do it for you anymore. Right. Yeah. They just, they tried to turn it into an isekai, and I was just like, I liked it when it was them building the models and fighting stuff, fighting each other. And then, you know, they did Keeping it simple. Weird, then they did other weird goofy stuff with that, like um, the VR projection world that the models fight and kind of bleeding into reality. You yeah. know, that was okay. I could get on board with that. But then Bill Divers was like, there's this world in the game that exists outside the parameters of the normal game. And I'm just like, shut Who cares? Also, the okay. characters in Build Divers, whatever the second one was, I can't remember, were like, oh, we were the side characters in the first series. You should still care about us. So I, okay, that's nice. Okay. But yeah, bringing this giant tangent to an end, just to uh, probably get across that we are... Not Gundam aficionados, and whoever is a diehard Gundam fan and for some reason is listening to this episode, still listening to this episode, probably just just tearing out their hair already, just just half bald. Excuse you, we are Gundam experts. Yes, of course. Yes, we're Gundam. Yes, yes. We are Gundam experts. That we are. And as Gundam experts... I have uh, been watching Gundam since Wing aired on Toonami. <laughs> I feel like I have a certain level of knowledge of this gargantuan franchise. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, let's maybe not call us Gundam experts, but Gundam witnesses. Uh, <laughs> wait, that has weird connotation to it. That sounds like we're just some kind of weird religion like Jehovah's Witnesses or something. No, no, let's not do, say that. I don't know how I like that. Gundam wi- victims. Um, maybe that? I don't know. G- Gundam. Gundam passengers. <laughs> Gundam. Gundam. Orega Gundam da. We, we, we are. No, we are not Gundams. Or, uh, get Setsuna out of here. Uh, oh, no, man. we are. I, f- I, f- I feel content with we are Gundam passengers. We're along for the ride, but we're not steering the ship. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's All right. Like we're not we're not super invested in where this thing is going. We're just joining on some occasional trips here and there. So, all right, I I can live with that. I guess. Um, right. I am willing to accept get, that. So let's have another Gundam holiday trip. Uh, which from Mercury <laughs> is a first uh, for Gundam in the way that it has um, a female main character, hmm. a female. Gundam pilot as the main character. We have had female Gundam pilots before. But as far as I know, with my limited knowledge of the Gundam universe, the giant Gundam universe, she is Suleta, our main character, is uh, the first main female uh, character in this universe. Am I mistaken? Do you know? I... I think that's right. I mean, you know, there are... There are other uh, girls who are, you know, kind of main characters. Eh, I mean, I guess in the main line stuff, because there was, uh, there's What's-Her-Face in one of the build series, Fumina, I think, kind of a main character. But I feel like, yeah, saying that Suleta is probably first and foremost one of the uh, big main characters who is, you mm. know, female is, yeah. you know, an yeah. accurate assessment. Yes, and it is really interesting. And she has a really cool Gundam. I think Ariel looks great. Mm. I think it's a really cool design. Definitely some stuff that is more like uh, not as bulky, maybe so a bit more slender, I guess. But some Gundams always, you know, some Gundam designs already were that. So I wouldn't necessarily attribute that to uh, Herbie uh, uh, it having a female pilot or whatever. But it's definitely a striking design. I liked it a lot. It felt different enough from the other previous Gundam uh, models that I was like, yeah, that's cool. The way it uses its its uh, its bit weapon, you know, whatever they call funnels, bits, gun, I think here they're called gun bits, right? Yes. Right. So she can make a shield out of that. She can use that as a gun, as a sword, I think too. Uh, or at least she can just spread them out and just shoot with them from any angles, just like those bits or funnels usually do in uh, on other Gundam models when they have them. 
So that's cool. And yeah, what what's the whole setup of the show? The setup is kind of... I mean, my animalist says... Suleta Mercury leaves her planet and enters the Astikasia School of Technology at the behest of her mother. Their right and wrong are determined through duels between students. And the top-ranking duelist will receive Murina Rembrandt as their fiancé. This prize being decided by Murin's father, who is the head of the company and the school, whatever. Uh, when Gul Jeturk, the best pilot in school, and Murina's current fiancé demands that his betrothed move in with him, Suleta disapproves, so Gul challenges her. Although she emerges as champion, Suleta is subsequently detained on suspicion of piloting a forbidden type of mobile suit, a Gund Arm, or Gundam, which results in her victory being voided. Murina refuses to accept any more injustices and proposes another duel with even higher stakes. Now Suleta must triumph a second time, otherwise she will be expelled and the Gundam aerial that means so much to her will be destroyed. Which sounds like a very, on paper, a very weird high schoolish approach to Gundam. Mm. Where it's like, hey, we have this, this fixed setting of this school... And where everything is decided by duels, which is kind of, um, I don't want to say stolen, but slightly borrowed from Revolutionary Girl Utena, let's just say that. And also the uh, author of this, Ichiro Okuchi, uh, who we have mentioned favorably and unfavorably before. <laughs> mm. Most recently, mostly favorably with Skate uh, the Infinity, for example, which was a lot of fun. Uh, but he has also written, I think, either the novelization of Revolutionary Girl Ultra or a sequel novel or whatever, but he is not unfamiliar with the franchise. Uh, so, yeah, this kind of setup with the duels and everything and the girl coming in as a newbie on the school and with a maybe secret past, whatever, uh, is kind of close to that. So it feels like, okay, this is really unusual for Gundam, and where, where's the standard stuff? But the standard stuff is kind of in there, because this, again, is very much also about Earth versus the colonies. War. Lots of war. Mm -hmm. Forbidden technology, kind of. Everyone wants to have a Gundam, kind of, because it's the best weapon, whatever. But also, maybe forbidden, and... Dark machinations in the background and revenge and whatever. So it's not like this is like a whole, like, oh no, Gundam has been completely shot of a fight now or whatever, or, or a shoujo fight, and now it's not about all the old themes anymore. No, they're all still in there. It's all still, it's still Gundam stuff. War is bad and shit happens. And uh, more at this point of the show, I feel like in the episode zero than any of the uh, any of the uh, succeeding episodes, because like the whole first thing that we see, if that you see, if you watch the episode zero, is like Suleta, maybe, uh, you know, and her mom working on uh, under a professor on the Gund arm, which is kind of Gundams in this universe are have their roots like in the development of medical pros uh, prosthetics, and. They kind of want to... They, they have this negative, this detrimental effect to the health of the pilots in this universe. That's why they are, they're they kind of forbidden. And that's why companies kind of want to get rid of them or whatever, or other companies. And the doctor that Suleta's mom works under, Dr. Cabro, tries to evolve them further to get rid of that side effect and make Gundams the new thing that helps people explore space. It's not supposed to be a weapon. It's supposed to help people like live in space better, like better uh, evolve to a life uh, and adjust to a life in space. And mm. that's what their goal is. But then hostile takeover from another company happens and so on, which is, you know, by the guy who is Murina's father, who he is the kind of instigator behind all, the, uh, all of that. And, uh, you know, destroys the base with all, all the uh, scientists get killed, whatever. But uh, Suleta and her mom get, get to escape and then the next thing we see in episode one is Suleta all growing up and getting into that school. And then, you know, shit happens. She's making friends. She's making enemies. And 
with the student council and everything, you know, and uh, getting a fiancé kind of in Murina. Uh, Murina. Uh, and then, you know, they try to create their own company at some point and try to make Gundam a name that uh, is is accepted and everything, but also not go into war, which is a very interesting part of the show where they're like, are we actually, what are we going to do with this, with our company? Like, the easiest way to would be to make the Gundam a weapon, but Suleta kind of want, doesn't want to do that. And then they decide we're going going to go into, you know, me- medical stuff. The thing that, you know, Gundams kind of initially were intended for, but mm. of course were mispurposed as humans do as weapons. So uh, they kind of go go to, back to the original idea of Gundams. Uh, and, you know, that's kind of what the whole first season is about. Like, a Suleta getting into coming into the school, taking making a name for herself, um, like besting a few people in combat to get her wishes through and to survive basically, and to not to, to not lose her Gundam and whatever, and to also create her own company together with Miorene uh, and everything, and that is kind of most of what happens. And then you know in the background some. Some dark machinations with, oh, we have like three... How many main companies do we have? Three, right? I think it was... I believe so, yeah. Yeah. And uh, they, of course, all are vying for the favor of the big head company and everything and want to advance their own weapon sets. And, you know, there's some characters involved with that. And, yeah, that all plays in the background. Also, uh, Suleta's mom comes back at some point like it gets becomes part of the picture and she is probably the biggest mystery in this maybe of what her motives are and everything but also maybe not because maybe she's just out for revenge and everything she wears a mask and i i was complaining in our sneak peek or like why why did they give that away like why did they why did they show us in the f- episode zero uh, who Soleta's mom is, so that we can also uh, already assume who um, Miss Prospera uh, Prospera is. Yeah, like it's a weird Prospera. narrative choice. I thought that, but then you know, immediately in the show, they make clear, like after the first episode, she appears that she is Soleta's mom, and there's yeah. no real any mystery. It's only a mystery, maybe that you know she was one of the scientists who survived the massacre on the on the uh, Gundam research station. Uh, to other companies, to other people. That's a secret to them. But we are, as viewers, are supposed to be closed in. And I wasn't sure about that uh, when we watched episode zero in the first episode of uh, of the proper show. It's like, mm-hmm. oh, okay, no, they just didn't want to make this a secret. It's just like, hey, okay, the real secret is what are her motives? What is she actually trying to do? And also a bunch of other things in this. Like, there are big question marks in this show above a bunch of things. The biggest one at this point, I feel like, and I don't know if you agree, uh, is Suleta herself, which was really interesting. Don't know if we talked about this on Discord or something already, if I mentioned it to you there, but there's like this weird thing. Suleta wasn't her name in episode zero. What was her name again? Uh, Elnora, who is Lady Prospera, uh, that's her real name, and uh, Elnora Samaya which is Suleta's mom's real name. Her daughter's name in episode zero is Eri. And in the show, then, of course, we is, I, I just automatically assume, okay, Suleta is uh, an alias, just so that she doesn't recognize, you know, there can be no connection made from her to her mom, to the massacre, whatever, so that they don't get found out. And so ever. it's just for their own protection, right? Mm, right. That's why she ad- uh, uh, her mother gave her the name Suleta to, you know, get into, enlist into the school. Uh, but stay uh, insc- uh, inconspicuous. But they drop like these weird hints of that that make me very suspicious about the origin of Ariel of the Gundam and how it actually how they got over the hump of piloting it not being detrimental to the pilot's health anymore. Like every time Suleta is in the Gundam, first uh, is she sees like when these bi- when the funnels or bits the gun bits dance around her, she sees them as little children. <laughs> Which is really weird, mm. and there are also some other hints dropped that she's that you feel like she maybe is not airy 
I feel like that's one of the things, the big question marks in this show at this point. Is Suleta really Eri, or did something happen to Eri, and she maybe is part of the Gundam? There are a bunch of other things that play into that, because we have also one of the um, other corporations that apparently... I don't know. Create like uh, like pilots for the gun uh, for for their um, for their mobile suits that are maybe clones or not, or they get their memories erased and stuff like that. Like Elan is one of them, right? Mm. Uh, one of those enhanced people, but they also seem to have a limited time span where they can actually pilot the the uh, mobile suits and uh, or or the Gundams. Like they were created, like these enhanced people, like Elan, who was one of the of the guys of, in the school, were created to specifically pilot Gundams. But since these the negative effects haven't been uh, haven't been uh, erased from uh, from piloting Gundams yet, like they have a limited time span, and it seems like they have. I don't know. One of the companies, I forgot what the company's name was, has like a bunch of clones or whatever or enhanced people that they just gobble up from the street and change their identity and and whatever uh, and their their memory to to pilot a Gundam and that 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 kind of sows the seed in terms of a lot of bad shit going down when it comes to actually furthering the development of Gundams in this universe. And I I really wonder and that's just again another one of my wild throws out there. I wonder if Prospera sacrificed her daughter for the Gundam experiments and created clones of her until she was able to fully control Ariel. And Suleta is one of the last enhanced whatever clones of Eri that exist. And all the other kids that she sees when she controls the Gundam, when she has the bits flying around, those are all previous versions of, of Eri that died when pilots in the Gundam. And the memories of her she implemented into the database of Ariel, and that's at some point so many minds were in sync in that Gundam that it was actually able to pilot it without any side effects. That's the weird place my mind goes to at this point because I, for some reason, Prospera strikes me as this as this really really fucked up villain. All all mask characters in Gundam shows are usually villain characters. Usually true. So her just be, you know, she has a motive. She has a, she definitely has an agenda here. The question is, is it just standard revenge? Or is she just, has she gone completely insane? I mean, she has lost her, her husband. Maybe she has lost her daughter at some point. She has lost her, basically her life. She has lost an arm, whatever. Mm. And I wonder how crazy she actually is. That's the thing I'm wondering right now. I really wonder... How much of this is just, you know, just weird imagery uh, that Gundam loves to put in certain things, right? We talked about all the new ty- weird new type shit in Universal Century. Mm-hmm. But I wonder, I really wonder, because they, they really throw that in there a lot of the times. And Suleta just being really connected and saying, oh, Ariel is like my sister. And I'm like, mm. you, know, you know, I had seen some people theorizing about suleta being like a clone or something Mm. but i don't really think i had seen a whole lot of theorizing about the other things you're throwing out there but it oh god it's starting to make sense oh no (laughs) oh no i feel like the show has a really and and the thing is the show feels kind of light right for a gundam show this show with these weird these weird side bits aside right with elan who apparently gets killed once he has served his purpose by mm. by 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 the uh, pile company arm right by uh, pile is one of the three big companies i think it's Turk, pale and grassley big... Gra- grassley yeah and once apparently one of their pilots have ser- has served his purpose and land lost to whatever and uh, to to uh, to Soleta and duel whatever apparently at least his memory gets erased but i think he gets just killed Right, and we get another Elan, or maybe the real Elan at this point, and the other one was just just one double. I don't know. It has not been made super clear yet. Mm. But the first version we meet of that character apparently gets killed. So that's one of the darker bits. But aside from, yeah, super I, I, dark. I do wonder if the second Elan 
is the original or not. Yes, that's what I'm wondering too. Maybe he believes he is, but maybe he also isn't. <gasps> oh my god, if he believes he is the reason, oh! Yeah, yeah. But so, that, begs, that, beg, that begs a question. Did the first one think he was the original? No, because didn't he come face to face with the second? Uh, I think so. I think so. So he could have. So he must have known that he wasn't the original. I th- yeah, yeah. This that goes. Kind of... This goes places that I didn't really think about while watching, man. Yeah, yeah. It's good when shows do that. But yeah, so that's one of the dark bits, and then you have the potentially dark bit that that might just exist as crazy crazy thoughts in my crazy head. But <laughs> aside from that, this is mostly a really light Gundam show because first of all, all the or all the deadly duels. Uh, besides the v- episode zero and the very end of uh, this first season don't really have any real casualties. They're mm. just kind of mock battles. Like, no no people die in those battles. It's not real war. It's like stage. It's like a stage one-to-one fight, usually. Also, we have a team fight in there, which is kick-ass. And, you know, that makes it lighter. The high school setting makes it, makes it lighter. It being mostly about, you know, a bit of high school rivalries, but also creating your own company. Being, It feels like it's not as big scale in the beginning and also mm. not as, you know, dark. Rah, war is the worst thing. Of course it is. Death everywhere. And we have still the, like I said, the Gundam themes in there. Um, Crony people. What they're called here? Spatians. Right. Yes. Spatians versus Earthians, and we have one character that is very much racist against Earth people or space space people, and the other way around, we have a bunch of those in the show, and that is definitely in there, so that's one of the more serious bits. But aside from that, it's a lot of characters, you know, having fun, Suleta being very flustered at everything. <laughs> <laughs> really, she, you, 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 you recognize that she has not been... In the company of a lot of other people for a long time. She has mm. to get really used to talking to other people. Maybe because she hasn't been alive that long. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so maybe oh she's my... not just protected. <laughs> oh, my God. If the... See, I wasn't thinking that that that's 5D chess. I wasn't thinking that. But now that it's out there, I'm like, oh, God, that that's probably it, isn't it? Mm. We'll see. But, yeah, we... It's still, it's very light. It's, you know, you get a bit of drama. You have people fighting for each other's fiancé, whatever, right? In a, <laughs> in a duel uh, where they have to cut off each other's antenna from the Gundam or whatever. And, you know, you have over-the-top characters. Guel, who we meet in the beginning, is like a giant ass. But he also, you know, he evolves. He becomes a cool character in his own right after a while. So that's neat. Mm. You know, he, I really hated him in the beginning. But then they kind of turn him around. They, they really humble him. They humble his ass. Big time. Oh, oh, yes. Man. Oh, he gets put in his place like several times. So much that you feel sorry for him at some point. Yeah. Well, and then there's another moment where you really feel like, Ugh, for him. Uh. Yeah, yeah. With his father. His father is, is, is the real asshole. Like, his. the... All the dads in this. I think this is another one of those shows that is really where one of the big themes is parents are horrible. Yeah. <laughs> I, and I think that extends to Lady Prospera. It's not as obvious in this first season, but every time you see her interacting with Suletter, there's like this undertone of big manipulation energy there. I kind of feel like Shadik's father is probably the least bad of them. Yeah. Yeah, but he definitely still has his own, you know, things going on. Absolutely. I mean, he was involved kind of with the massacre, massacre on the, you know, but, on the Gundam but, stage. But Delling and Vim are just, they're, they're terrible to their children. Yes. They're awful. Yes. They are awful. And it's nice getting their children getting like one up at them at some point in mm. a way. It's fun. It's, it's a good, it, it feels just like, like, I think never has a... Like a concept presentation, a PowerPoint presentation <laughs> for for a proposed company being so exciting because it's Miorina against her father at that point in that on that stage. When they she proposes their their company concept and has to win the favors of all the other, you know, of the sponsors. And she actually asks her dad for help and he grants it because at this point he accepts what she is doing. Which she shouldn't have to do. He should just support her regardless. But it's nice to actually see her grow so much that she is able to like swallow her pride and do what's good for her mm. and not what's good for her dad. Like she's not being rebellious 
for being for rebellion's sake, but also doing something that she wants and actually using her father for that because she's using him. She uses his fun. She uses his influence, and she uses d- does that to further her own goals. So you know, she kind of learns the economy way, whatever. Mm. She knows what to do. She knows how to live. Uh, she knows how to work in this environment. So that's cool to see. That's really good. Like Murina, uh, Murina is one of the most fun characters in this show, and uh, you know her energy with Suleta is really good. And uh, you know, it's nice to see them. God, their dynamic together, together is really, really good. Yeah, it, it's a lot of fun. Like, of course, big lesbian energy, of course. Oh, without a doubt. <laughs> and, it, and to be in there, I mean, again, re- well, revolutionary we, uh, girl Utuna had that uh, a lot as well. So, I mean, when um, Mirene says to Suleta, yeah, I am your fiance now, Suleta is like, hey, mm-hmm. what do you mean? But we're both girls. And Mirene is just like, yeah. So what? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it's yeah, like, after a while, they really, like, they really grow fond of each other. And I feel like... There is the seed. There is like this misunderstanding uh, at some point. Uh, Mirina doesn't get that her relying on Suleta makes Suleta really happy. Mm. Uh, like she wants to feel needed, and Suleta also takes the whole marriage thing pretty seriously. While Mirina seems to be very hand wavy about it, like mm. she's, yeah, that's fine with me. It's, it's just it doesn't mean much to me. But of course, actually, she isn't. <laughs> that's just the front. Yeah. And thankfully, anime timing works the opposite way this time and actually dissolves unnecessary drama. Because in the episode where it comes kind of like to a head, Mi- uh, Miorina overhears Suleta airing her grievances and insecurities uh, about their relationship to her mom uh, over the calm and uh, promptly takes the initiative to let Suleta know that she means the world to her. Mm. Because... Suleta has like this mantra thing where she always says like, if you run, you gain one. If you move forward, you gain two. Mm -hmm. Meaning running away gets you a single benefit like safety. But moving forward and standing your ground will give you experience and confidence, even though you might put yourself out there and at risk. But it's better that way. And that's what her mom taught her. You know, we'll see if that is actually... You know, I mean, has a, has a perverse side to it. I mean, it's <laughs> like, a good way of thinking, but uh, hmm. mm-hmm. yeah, again, big manipulation energy there can't be applied to all situations. But I guess it it uh, works for Suleta because she is otherwise a very shy and easily flustered person. Like I said, mm. she has confidence in her piloting skills and the experience to pick it up, but she does not have that much confidence in her relationship to Miurina. So when Miurina comes to her and it's like. Hey, your mantra, move forward, gain two, helped me not to be a threat anymore. Like, I am in this place right now that I am where I am happy and don't want to run away from everything anymore. Because that was Murina before. Like, she wanted to run away from the school. That's how they meet, actually. She wants to escape from her father, everything. She wants to throw any way, uh, everything away because she hates her life. And then Soleta comes into her life and changes all of that. Mm. Everything. And Mirina recognizes that, and she says that in her eyes, that's all thanks to Soleta. And that scene in episode 11, where they finally see eye to eye, is like one of the most rewarding scenes in Gundam ever, I would say, <laughs> just from an emotional standpoint. It's really cute also. Like, those two really seem to love each other mm. And at this point. And I love that. There's something happening after that that might put a real dent into that at the very in the very last episode of the season which i don't want to give away but holy shit <clears throat> oh god that <laughs> which uh also puts another you know another weight on the hmm there might be not everything right with uh, suleta's upbringing yeah. maybe her mom did some weird things and whatever so hmm we'll see about that <laughs> But yeah, uh, it was a great scene, nonetheless. It really um, caught me off guard. Definitely a good shock value. Oh yeah, absolutely. And that's probably the best thing about this show is, uh, about this first season anyway, is the relationship between Miurina and Suleta because it's really well developed, but also all the other characters are fun. Like there are a bunch of interesting people in there with some hidden sides, like, you know, maybe 
some being a hidden spy uh, who I don't want to give away and, you know, uh, having some connections to other people that you don't initially think, but also being really interesting in, in their own right. And, you know, then you have characters that are like Choo Choo, who is coming off very bratty in the beginning and kind of annoying because she's very biased against patients because some of them have treated her like dirt her entire life. So it's understandable, but she's still really hung up on that and that can get annoying. But she warms up to Suleta, who is a Spatian. And I also cheered when she just punches one of the bitches who sabotaged the exam right in the face. That was really good. Uh, so... <laughs> Yeah, so there are a bunch of cool characters in this. Uh, in not all of them get the spotlight as much as our main characters, um, of course. But I felt like the whole cast was really fun in this show. I don't know how you felt about it. Was there a favorite of yours? Did you have like a, a particular person that were like, oh yeah, I like this character and I want to see more of them in this next season? Uh, or did all the characters that you attached yourself to get enough um, screen time already in the first season? I mean, I'm. I love Suleta. <laughs> She's great. Yeah, same. She's great. And you know, obviously, it's scary. And obviously, there's more to her than we know. But oh yeah. But I want to know what's Nika's deal. I yeah, want to know more about her. Absolutely, Nika is one of those question marks. And in the student council, there's also some of those that are mm, okay. Maybe we'll learn more about them. But uh, and obviously, there's more to know about Elan. So yes, Elan, absolutely. Whatever version was there ever <laughs> a real? Uh, who knows? We'll see. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. Like all the all the company heads are interesting too in regards to Pi. Probably the most eerie ones with the weird ladies that are that seem like almost like robots. Yeah, um, the the whole maybe there the, are the whole like co CEO thing of Pale is like. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, I like the concept in itself, I guess, but they are just. They are eerie ladies. They yes. seem to be very cold uh, in terms of, but also have have always have a weird smile on their face. Like they, like they're in on a joke that you are not in on. <laughs> they're laughing about a joke that you're not in on. But it's hmm, yeah, it's interesting. It's it's also like I said, it's interesting to see all the uh, the uh, company maneuvering between the different companies and trying to uh, like upend each other. Like uh, it's it's uh, it's really fun to see. Like. Um, the forming of a new company has never been so dramatic, like I said. And all the thing that surrounds that and all the, oh, we're trying to take out the Gundam because so that our company can get at it or whatever, you know, all of that kind of feels cool. Mm. And it's nice to also see that, like, side. I, I, I appreciate that for some people it might be a bit dry, maybe, that part of the show, because it's a, it's a, it's a big contrast to what is going on on the school side of things, because that feels very emotionally character focused, while... The all the stuff that happens around this is really a lot of political maneuvering, but that is all has also always been part of Gundam. I feel like so you should expect that going into a show like this. Yeah, for sure. So it's at least for me it wasn't a surprise. I was actually expecting more of that from the get go, but it was like, oh, okay, they're doing this. This is new with the school stuff and everything, which is the more, you know, fun character bits and stuff like that, more lighthearted. And then on the side, you have the usual Gundam warfare stuff, only this time it's more corporate warfare than anything else yet. Yeah. That might change in this second season. I assume it will. There will probably be all-out war between the different companies, probably. But, you know, we got not that much in this season for that. It was more like some plots to secure funds or whatever or to fuck someone over in one company and uh, with the help of you know the Gundam or whatever or with uh, with some of the characters doing certain things and something happening in the school with you know the duels and everything and that working against one company over another and shit like that so but it was a very interesting to com a component to the the center stage that the the whole school storyline has in this so I, I thought that was cool. And it seems like you did as well. Yeah. I mean, it's sort of interesting just from the perspective that, you know, you, you hear about a lot of the, um, the, the background talk of like, oh, yeah, the, the original Gundam was mo uh, manufactured by Yashima Heavy Industries. And that's it. OK, <laughs> that company exists. Cool. We, uh -huh. we, that's part of the universe. Mm -hmm. But now... That it's a lot more in the forefront and it's, you know, the big corporate warfare element that you were saying. I think it, yeah, it does have a lot of the same like politicking 
it had for it, but I feel like it gives it enough of a different flavor. It's definitely it definitely feels fresh in more ways than one. Not only because the main character is you know uh, a female character, not because you have a kind of gay romance in there, uh, mm. lesbian romance in there, but also because just the way the show is structured and what the focus is put on and who the different parties are. It definitely feels like something else mm. uh, for a change than your usual Colony versus Earth stuff. Uh, or, you know, if you have something like H, uh, which was more against aliens, I guess. Uh, but, uh, yeah, so it, it, felt, uh, it felt fresh, like I said. And what we haven't really talked about yet is the animation, which is... Uh, probably the best Gundam show has looked since a long time. I feel like yeah. this is this. I mean, Iron Blooded Orphans looked really good in parts, but I feel like this, in terms of consistency and every battle kind of looking incredible, mm. is really something. Like Sunrise, just they maybe felt like they had to deliver something extra for this. I don't know, maybe. But it definitely looks like they, they tried to do that. And uh, yeah, it, uh, it's a joy to witness. Because, yeah, like I said, all the all the duels are great in this. They look fantastic. Like, all the action scenes in this show mm-hmm. are really something. And the character models are sharp and cool. Like, some really unique, cool designs in this that I uh, that I thought were great to look at. Favorite battle for me probably was the battle against Shadik and his weird harem crew. <laughs> uh, yeah, but not only because it was a team battle. I love team battles. But also because Solita actually doesn't deliver the final blow. It's her team that does it. So that kind yeah. of fits the whole theme of starting the company together and everyone having their role and stuff like that and uh, fulfilling a purpose and doing their part uh, to making shit happen. And uh, that kind of works for uh, uh, that fight too. Like everyone has a, has, a role, her, has a role to play and only together they are able uh, to actually stay on even ground with uh, Shadik uh, and his crew. So yeah, I thought that was really great. I love that it's called Gunt Technology and they basically show Galley slash uh, Alita from Battle Angel Alita in one shot of the show. Which is called Gunn in Japan, mm. <laughs> not Metal Angel Alita. So I don't know, that was probably intentional. Uh, but uh, yeah, I like that. <laughs> so there are a bunch of fun little nods there too. If one has watched Revolutionary Girl Utenera, probably enough nods in there as well uh, for fans of that show. I would assume there are. I haven't seen it. But, yeah, it's. Uh, Utena has been sitting in my Crunchyroll queue for a very long time, and I just Same. need to watch it. Yes, yeah, Sam. I probably, after after this show is done, after which for Mercury is done, or in the break between now the two... I don't even know. When is the second season of which for Mercury supposed to April. drop? April. Oh, it's coming up. All right. That's good. Yes, it's very so soon. After, so after we're done with that, if they... I mean, if it only gets two seasons, maybe it's going to be... 48 episode or something we'll see but yeah if it's longer then they kind of broke it up real weird because you know the all of the most of the past ones are broken up into like 226s right or 224s yeah 24s 26s into cores yeah seasons whatever you want to freaking call them whatever you want i don't care yeah (laughs) yeah (laughs) i'm so so sorry guys i'm no it's fine (laughs) but yeah I'll, I'll check it out after that, uh, probably after this show is wrapped up, mm. uh, to see if uh, how many commonalities are in there. And there is, if there's another break, if if we get more seasons after the one in April, which might be the case, we'll see. Mm. Uh, then I'll maybe watch it in between those. But yeah, I thought uh, this was one of the most promising Gundam shows in recent time. Big asterisk. I think I've said this about the first season of Iron Blooded Orphans too. I hope that's. Uh, I, I hope it keeps the momentum going. Yes, same. I mean, there are so many interesting seeds, ha ha ha, uh, <sighs> planted here with, with, with all the characters in here. Like, what is actually up with Suleta? Like, mm. what is what is what is going on with her? What's going on with her mom? Right? Mm. Will all my my weird suspicions? 
become reality or am I super off the course? But, I mean, you know. I, I think you're on to something with certain parts. With other parts, yeah. I'm not 100%. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me neither. <laughs> but I, I just want to put it out there. I love putting weird theories out there and see how much of that turns out to be true because yeah some of those are safe bets because prospera is very like she's very deftly manipulating suleta like in the in the final episode to go a certain route like like she programmed her with that mantra of take a step forward to gain two right yeah uh, like she manipulated manipulated her with that mantra all her life to do her bidding or like it's even like it's a like it's a code a code phrase or something that activates oh, God. suleta in a certain way because she becomes this, gets this empty stare, right? Like, okay, now I have my mission or something like that. It feels like she's like it's a trigger, uh, trigger phrase or something, and that's why she's also always repeating it. But when her mom says it, she kind of starts just doing what her mom wants, like she's putting her under a spell, and that's just that's giving me made super bad guy, also shitty anime mom vibes. So we'll see where that goes. I have no idea. These are all just assumptions and suspicions. Mm. Let's see where it goes. But we have enough uh, interesting other characters that still have big question marks over the head, and w- at least in terms of where they will go. Murine, uh, Guel, uh, Nika, like you mentioned, mm. um, Shadik, uh, Elan, uh, you know, some of the companies and where they will go, especially Pale, I guess. Uh, that's the most interesting one, I would say. Mm. Uh, so, yeah. There's a bunch of interesting stuff still in the show that uh, uh, that could take some really, really riveting developments in the second season. But since it's gonna, we can't be sure. Maybe wait for our review of season two <laughs> uh, to <laughs> determine. Hey, this is this is a really good Gundam show uh, uh, until the very end this time around. Hooray! <sighs> uh, yeah. So um, we'll see. We'll see. We, we'll see where it goes. I mean, like I said, Okuchi has. Definitely done some really cool shows. Uh, he also has done written some pretty bad ones that went really off the rail after uh, a short while or even in the beginning. So, huh, mm-hmm. we'll see. We'll see whatever happens may happen. Maybe this is one of his good ones. Maybe this is another Escape the Infinity. Maybe not in terms of craziness, although maybe going crazy in a different way. But uh, let's just hope it's not another Valrave or... <laughs> <laughs> don't don't speak that into reality. <laughs> yes, so <laughs> we'll see. We'll see where it goes. But so far, it seems super promising. It looks pretty. The music by uh, uh, by Takashi uh, Omawa is great. Who has also done the music for Fantasy Star Online Two, the animation. Mm. That's great. Like the whole presentation is fantastic, and there are a bunch of cool characters in there. And I like the angle with uh, the fresh angle with the school du- duels. Uh, at least fresh for Gundam. Uh, I like the corporate warfare stuff and building your own company from scratch and stuff like that and where they actually want to take the Gundam, which is, you know, anti-war stuff, which, of course, won't pan out. We know that. It's Gundam. Mm. But, you know, at least the, they have the ambition. Uh, so that's cool. And we, I'm really interested to see where the show goes. And it seems you are, too. Oh, for, oh, for sure. I There's still so much I want to know. Tell me. Tell me. <laughs> yeah, that probably will do in the second season. At least some of it. Uh, yeah. Unless we get even more seasons after that. So, yeah. We'll see. Uh, yeah. Where, John, again, where can people watch this show? Uh, it's definitely on Crunchyroll. I believe you can also watch it on Sunrise's website, Gundam.info, which I believe just redirects to YouTube. Um hmm. And it's it's another show that I think it's on Netflix in certain territories. It's on it's it's easy to find. But yeah, if if you don't want to pay for a streaming service, it's on YouTube. Yeah, uh, definitely check it out. Uh, I think it's one of the most promising Gundam shows again with a big asterisk uh, in recent times. And I can't wait to see where we go from here. Mm-hmm. Probably space. <laughs> And that is a wrap on the 140th episode of Anime Brain Freeze. All the music in this podcast is from the Double Dragon Neon soundtrack by the amazing Jake Kaufman. Please go to virt.bandcamp.com and check out his awesome work. 
Our show is available on most of the popular podcast services, but it's always worth visiting AnimeBrainFreeze.com for our review index and more. Leave us comments and questions on YouTube, follow us on Twitter at AnimeBrainFreeze, or send an email to AnimeBrainFreeze at gmail.com. We would love to read your feedback. Thanks for tuning in. We hope you had a good time, and please join us again on our next episode. Mach's gut. Take care, everybody. Next time on Anime Brain Freeze. The threats of the Joe Star legacy converge in the least likely of places, Florida. Florida.